There you go. Morning. Morning. There you go. You guys excited? Yes. All right. I'm excited to be here. If you're not excited, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I heard this from another pastor. He said, a husband and a wife, Sunday, you know, church time, Sunday, husband goes to the wife, honey, I don't feel like I want to go to church today. So, so the wife goes, honey, what are you talking about? You have to go to church today. It's important. It's Sunday. Honey, I really don't want to go to church today. Man, people there don't even say hi to me. Honey, you have to be at church today. Okay, honey, give me one good reason why I should be in church today. Honey, you're the pastor. (laughs) I heard that from another mister. Pastor Mark is here just to let you know. Okay, I'm giving the word, but Pastor Mark is here. We're not doing that here. But anyway, welcome, welcome to Life in the Sun. Welcome to our series in Miracles. Today we are doing, uh, we're, we're continuing uh, in this series. We're going to talk about something that uh, I think everybody must have heard something about it. Jesus walking on water. Okay? In fact, let me ask you this. Even before you read the Bible, how many of you have heard of this already? Almost everybody? Can I say everybody? I think everybody, right? Even before reading the Bible, we've heard a story about uh, oh, this Jesus, even, even though we don't even know who Jesus is. That Jesus walked on water, right? So this is good. This is a good place. We, got a, we already have a foundation, okay, that everybody knows what I'm going to be talking about. And if you happen to miss a couple of, uh, the couple of Sundays because you didn't feel like going to church, it's okay, okay? That's the past. We look forward. So we're gonna, I'm going to read out of the book of John first, that I'm, but I'm really going to look at the book of Mark uh, for the sake of uh, us doing this series in the book of John. But just like it says here, miracles. Let him be known. So I want to show you something about the Lord today, okay, as, uh, as we look into this miracle. So the first, let me read from the book of John. No need for the uh, power, uh, PowerPoint right now. So coming from the book of John, because we're doing this as the, we call it miracles. The book of John says it's, our, it's a sign. So this is actually sign number four in the book of John. So in chapter 6, verse 16, this is what it says. You can just listen to me, okay? Faith comes through hearing, hearing the word of Christ. So just listen. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. That's it. That's that's the event that uh, we all know that Jesus walked uh, walked in the water. They were afraid, but he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. They willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. One miracle based on one verse. That's it. And they saw Jesus walking on water. But yet we've heard so much about it. Amen? So I'm going to take from the book of Mark, because Mark has... uh, has, a, has much more information, and I believe that and I'm, I'm excited because this kind of changed something on the way I see things, okay? So let's go read from the book of Mark, and I'll show you. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. This continues from Pastor, or Pastor Brother Lawrence's message last week, the dinner in the hillside, okay? If you were here, after the dinner in the hillside happened, the people wanted to get Jesus and establish him as the king or the returning Messiah. They wanted, the, the, they wanted to kick out the Romans, so they really wanted to get uh, Jesus. But what did Jesus do? This is what he did. He said, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. So he sent the group away, and he told his disciples. Now, look at that. Pay attention to that. We'll come back to this later. It says, he made his disciples get into the boat. In the book of John, uh, as I read earlier, it says that they got into the boat and they left. Here it says he made him or he made them go into the boat. Okay? Verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. This is a practice that Jesus always does. Okay? He goes up alone and, and prays to the mountain. If he does that, we should too. Not to the mountain, but pray. Okay, now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Verse 48, then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would 
have passed them by. Take a mental note of that again, okay? And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 51, Then he went up into the boat to them, and the, wi and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Verse 52. Last month, uh, I, was, uh, I was in the first, uh, I, I talked about the first miracle of turning water into wine. But we did a ministry time. If you were here, you remember? The word that I got was that what? A, a, uh, uh, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire that comes is a tree of life. And I know we did a ministry time wherein we cannot receive the things of God if our heart is sick. We didn't plan for the scheduling of the messages, okay? This was done uh, in the beginning of the year, so this is not like I chose this message. But look at that. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. The word hardened there is the word not, oh, I don't want to see it, I don't want to hear it. It's really being dull. It's lacking understanding. That's what it means. And why is Jesus saying that? Because it says, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. They were amazed not, oh, wow, Jesus, you're so good. How were you able to do that? No, it was actually saying that, wow, how are you able to do that, Jesus? A few hours ago, probably not even two hours ago, of course, not in, uh, in, the, in this passage. They were just eating bread that multiplied. They see Jesus walking on the water, and they still have that thought and saying, Wow, Jesus, how are you able to do this? And that's why Jesus said, or Mark said, For they did not understand about the lobes, because their heart was dull to understand. And in that first week, I remember saying, uh, uh, receiving from the Lord, we can go on 52 weeks of, uh, of miracles and we still won't get uh, understanding because the heart, it really is an issue of the heart. Amen? So today, uh, and I'm believing that we dealt with that, okay? Pastor Elmer prayed for all of us today. I'm going to believe that, but if there's still some, we'll, we'll continue and we'll see, okay? So let's pray one more time. I just wanted to focus on that uh, for a little bit. But let me just pray one more time. Father, thank you. Thank you that your word tells us it is the truth. It is the truth that shall set us free. So now, Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of, under, of our understanding that we would see this truth, that you would allow understand, understanding to come. And we say, in the name of Jesus, we speak against anything that will snatch the word away from our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so going back to verse, the, the first one, go ahead. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go. Uh, promise I'll get you out of here before 12, okay? But I want to spend uh, a little bit of time here. I think everything about this, uh, about this miracle hinges in this word right here. He made his disciples get into the boat and go. Why would he force uh, the, the King James Version if you have one, it says, he constrained them. He constrained them. He compelled them. Basically, he forced them to get in the boat and says, go. See, John just says they got into the boat and they left. No, in the book of Mark, in the book of Matthew, it actually says he made his disciples go or get into the boat and go. Why? I've been meditating on this for two weeks, and the very first thing, that the, the, the question that popped up into my mind was, who benefited from this miracle when Jesus walked on the water? Okay, the first miracle was turning water into wine, correct? Who benefited from that miracle? The bride, the groom, the party, they were not embarrassed. They had so much wine. The party went on for another five days, okay? <laughs> right? So a lot of people benefited from that miracle. The healing, the second week, the healing of the, the man on the gate, who benefited from that miracle? The man that was healed. Last week, dinner on the hillside, who benefited from that miracle? More than 5,000 people were able to eat bread and fish, okay, olive garden style, on the grass, 
Okay? But who benefited from this miracle? They were only able to witness, right? Peter, of course, in the book of Matthew, he was the one that said, Lord, command me to go and I shall. I shall go out. And of course, Jesus said, then come. And of course, you know, he did his uh, moonwalk, walking to the water. Then eventually he was commanded by Jesus, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? It's a, it's a commendation and a rebuke at the same time because nobody else was able to do it. So this is, I've been meditating on it, and, and that was the question that first popped into my mind. Who benefited from this miracle? You know who? We do. Okay, I'll show you. <laughs> so immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go. Why do we need to force these fishermen to go on the boat? Remember their fishermen? They've been living in Galilee. Uh, only Peter is really above 21 years old. These guys are pretty much young. But they've been doing this fishing for, the, for uh, as long as their father took them out fishing. Okay? But he said he made his disciples go. Why? Because they understood how Galilee or the lake or, the, or how the, uh, the lake of Galilee works. What, am, what do I mean? They understood that at night a wind can just easily pick up and toss them around. And that's what happened to them, right? So that's why when Jesus said, go to the other side, they were actually very hesitant to go. Because they understood Galilee. They under, they, they've lived there. They were born there. Okay? For those of you who swim in the water, you understand what an undertow is, right? And they tell you that if you're pulled out uh, uh, with an undertow, what do you do? You go along with the, with the current, and then you you swim uh, sideways, right? So same thing with them. They knew exactly what they can get themselves into if they were to go in the boat at nighttime. But the thing is, they did. Why? Because Jesus forced them to. <laughs> Jesus basically said, I compel you, go, uh, go, get in your boat and go. So they did. And then what did Jesus do? He went and he prayed. So what's the implication of this to us? Many of us has received instructions from the Lord. Why in the boat? Because this is something familiar. And a lot of the instructions that I believe that we have received from the Lord is something familiar to us. Go reach your neighbor. Go reach your coworker. Go reach your family. Be a good father. Be a good mother. If you're a father, be a good father. If you're a mother, be a good mother. Okay, be a parent. Okay, if you're single, if you want to get married, be a, uh, be a good support. Make sure that you can support your, you make, it, make sure you can support the one you're going to be with. Okay? That's another life entrusted to you. Man? All of that. But really, there is much greater than just those little instructions. It's called the calling of God in our lives. Amen? Romans 8.28 tells us what? For all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. If you're born again, if you're here today, and you say you are born again, if you say that you are a Christian, then there is a call of God in your life. There is a purpose of God in your life. That is really the greater, uh, the greater principle behind this when he said go. You've been called to do something. Okay, not all of us has the same calling. In, in Ephesians, it's talk about the five-fold ministry, full-time ministry. But no, you're, if you're in the business arena, perhaps that is your call to be a good businessman, to be fair with your, with your payment, right? If you're called in, uh, in school, in the arts, that's the calling that you have. But all of us has a calling of peace and reconciliation. That's the ministry that God gave to us. That uh, Because we, be, we, we now have a peace with God, we can also share the peace of God to everyone. Amen? That is the call of God. And the thing is, and, uh, uh, after seeing all of this, you'll see how, uh, how amazing it is why Jesus actually walked on water. The calling of God, it tells us in, uh, when God gives you something to do, when God calls you, God never changes his mind. Amen. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. The calling and the giftings of God are irrevocable. He does not change his mind. So whether you're following it or you're not, it remains there. It doesn't change. I like how Pastor Mark, a few, I think last uh, month, when, we were, when he was talking about uh, coming from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that we were chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy, to be blameless in him in love. 
And when we were chosen, God already anticipated everything that we will ever need. And that's why the calling and the giftings of God or the giftings of God are irrevocable. And he made this illustration that when, when God called you before the beginning of time, he already had a 40-foot container prepared for you with all the giftings, with all the provisions, with all the blessings, with everything that you will ever need to fulfill that calling that God has placed on you. Amen? You know how a 40-foot container looks like? You look out there. There's one out there. Not now. Later on. <laughs> okay. There's one out there in the parking lot. But that's what, that's what Pastor Mark gave us, that beautiful illustration. Before the foundation of the world, God has given a calling, a purpose on you, on us. Amen? And if you're, and if you're not a born-again believer yet, that applies to you. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. You got to make a choice, though, if you want to receive. Amen? But that's it. Every gifting, every provision, every blessing that you will ever need to fulfill the calling of God in your life is already in that 40-foot container. All you got to do is access it, open the door, go start digging in there. You'll find it. You'll stumble one way or the other. You'll stumble upon your gift. I stumbled upon mine. Okay? So what am I saying? So there's a place. There's a place where the blessing of God is. There's a place where the provision of God is, and it's found in your calling. And that's why I said, get into the boat and go. Find your calling and go. In the book of 1 Kings, Elijah, I just got this this morning. I'm, I'm beginning to <laughs> pop out stuff that uh, in the very last minute. The 1 Kings, uh, Elijah, remember who Elijah is? If you name your son Elijah, good for you. Elijah was a prophet. Never really had it. Yes, he did. <laughs> Veggie tales. Okay. Elijah was a prophet, and he, and he went to King Ahab, and he, and he declared to King Ahab, for three years there shall not, neither be rain nor dew. Remember, Elijah is part of the land. So if there's a drought, he's also part of the land. And that's what happened. There was a drought in the land. But what did God say? God told Elijah, get out of there and go to the place that I will show you. Go to the brook. Kidron. And there he said, I have commanded the ravens to provide food for you in the morning and in the evening. What if Elijah never went to the place that God told him to go? He'll be in trouble. Will he get, fee uh, will he get food? No. Many of us calls to God and say, Lord, what's going on? Where's my blessing, Lord? Didn't you promise me my blessing? Yeah, but I also told you to go. You can cry all night and tell, and tell, Elijah could have done that, cry all night, stayed in the place where he talked to Ahab and said, Lord, where's the provision? I told you to go there because there I have provided or I have commanded the ravens to go there to feed you. Get in your boat and go. Man, and then it says that when the brook dried up because there was a drought because of his prayer, what did God say? Now, arise and Go to the woman of Seraphat, the widow. Once again, if Elijah decided to stay at the brook and he cries out, Lord, where's my provision? Did I tell you to arise and go? There's a place called there. <laughs> go there. Um, I forget what year this is. Uh, I was driving um, uh, Aganya Heights uh, Naval, uh, Naval Hospital. You guys familiar with that road? I think it was a Monday morning. I was in my prayer going to work. And all of a sudden, I was looking at the Nimitz, uh, what is that, the Nimitz Hills, you know, where all those beautiful houses are. And out of, my, out of the Spirit, God says, would you like to live there? So I thought, Lord, you want me to live up there? I said, Lord, yes, I want to live there. That was, I don't know how many years ago. Come to find out, over the years, I would, uh, you know, I would, I would meditate on it. Come to find out what God was really saying is, you want to go there, you want to live there. There is a place where God called you to be. There is a place where God says, this is my place of intimacy. This is the place where you are. And this is the place where you have the fullness of my blessing, the fullness of my provision, the fullness of your gift can expand in this place called there. So when God says, do you want to live there? I said, yes, Lord, I want to live there. Thinking that it's a geographical place. No, it's actually like Elijah. Now arise and go there. Amen. That's why Jesus, it all hinges on this one word. He made his disciples get into the boat and go. 
Many of us, uh, and I know if you feel, if you feel uh, down already, just say, ouch, okay? But the great thing is, you can still pick up and go. If it's up to God, he hasn't changed his mind. His calling for you has not changed. If it's up to you, if you've run away from it, it's easy. Just get back up and go. Amen? Go to the place that God says to go. I don't know exactly where your there is. I guess for me, I would say, I, I think I know where my there is. But that's the thing. Like what, I, like what Pastor Mark said, you have a 40-foot container waiting for you. Okay, it's already there. All you have to do is look around, dig around. One day, if you keep digging around, you'll stumble on one of them, okay? Uh, I heard, I he, I heard uh, somebody say, even a, a blind squirrel, if they just keep uh, looking, 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 they'll eventually find something, because even though they're blind, okay? But yeah, just keep trying, keep going. Like what Pastor Alwar said, just do it. Continue. Immediately, he said, he made them get into this boat and go. Your boat is really something that is familiar to you. Amen? You're good? When God says, uh, that's why in the book of Numbers 23, verse 19, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he shall repent. Whatever he says is it. He will not violate the words that comes out of his lips. So that's why when he said, go, this is the place for you. If you're here and the place for you is over there, you can cry all night, all day here, saying, Lord, where's the, where's the one that you promised me? Where's, the, where's the, the blessings that you promised me? And like what we sang earlier, the last song, you're already loved, you're already chosen, you're already blessed with all the spiritual blessings in Christ. But if you're here, but it says over there, go to your container. I guess that's a better word, Pastor Mark. Go to your container, okay? Go to your container. Okay, we'll get to the walking in water eventually. So immediately he said, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him, before him to the other side, to Bethsaida while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to pray, or he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. So where did Jesus go? Up to the mountain. One of the ways to read scripture is to look at it in the lens of the cross. What do I mean? In the Old Testament, every promises in the Old Testament is looking forward to the cross. All right? That's why you have promises in scripture where it says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Because Jeremiah also says that uh, Jeremiah, all the prophets are looking forward to Jesus. That's why a lot of the promises in the Old Testament is looking forward. But if we're living in the New Covenant, all our promises actually is already past. It's already done. You're already chosen, right, Ro? You're chosen, you're already loved, you're already redeemed, you're already been blessed. Everything is already done. That's why you can look for it. It's already there. So, uh, so you have to look at this in the, in, the, in the lens of the cross, and you can drive the principle, or you can pull out the principle behind this. So it says he departed to the mountain to pray. Mountain is a what? A high place. If you've ever checked in a Tumon, and you can see uh, in your, uh, what's a good spot? Right there in the middle. Hyatt? Is Hyatt the middle hotel? Or somewhere right there? Yeah, Hyatt. Let's say you're, you're staying in that Hyatt. You can have a view of the entire Tumon Bay. Correct? You can see, uh, you can, uh, on your left, you will see Hilton. On your right, you will see Nico Hotel. But you can see that the Tumon Bay is uh, shaped like a sea. But you have a bird's eye view of both sides. Left side and right side. You getting what I'm saying? Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. Go ahead, next please. Then he saw them straining. Uh, okay, we, anyway. Then he saw them straining at rowing. How was it that he was able to see them str uh, straining at rowing? Because even though he was on the mountainside, he never took his eyes off them. Just like what I said, if you uh, check in at Hyatt, you can have a bird's eye view of both the uh, Hilton Hotel and Nico Hotel, and you can see. You can take, you can see people, what, stand up paddling, you can see people uh, 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 swimming, you can see everybody. It was the same with Jesus. In fact, I heard it, it's actually Mount Arbel. This is a place they call Mount Arbel. Uh, I'll prove it once I get there one day, okay? When, once I get to Israel one day. It says, for the wind was against them, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. 
walking in the sea and would have passed them by. So the first the, a principle that we can pull out from this is that when God tells you to go, he will always keep his eyes on you. Yeah. Romans chapter 8 actually speaks of that. It says that he is seated at the right hand of God, always interceding for us. Amen? And what did he do besides from just watching them? It says about the port watch of the night. The port watch of the night is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It is also called the darkest night or the darkest hour of the night. If you find yourself in that place where you, you're thinking, Lord, I'm in the darkest hour of the night. I've been straining. I've been rowing. I've been trying all of this. But it seems like I cannot get anywhere. Now, it's different if you're there because of your own mistake, Okay. But even with that, the mercy of God covers you. Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 9, where it says in 8, for, for he demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. When you're suffering under the consequences of sin, Jesus came to die for you. And that's why in 5, uh, verse 9, it says, then much more than, since you've already been, let me get to it. Romans chapter 5. Verse 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you feel like you're in that place, you're rowing, you're rowing, but because it's really not because you're following God, but because you made a big mistake and you're just going through the consequences of your mistake, God is still merciful to you. That's the whole point why he died on the cross because we were all sinners. We were all suffering the consequences of our sins. But now if you're born again and you're now a believer and we make mistakes, come on. We're still making mistakes. But the mercy of God tells us this, for if when we were enemies, we were, reconciled to, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled. Much more. You're now reconciled. Okay? Shall... Uh, uh, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his light. God will find a way to get you out of your situation even though it is on your own mistake. There might be some testing and there might be some proving, but God in his mercy, if he saved you when you were a sinner, much more than that now you're a believer, that he will save you out of that life, out of that misery, out of that consequence of your own action. Amen? But if you're totally following the Lord, like what these guys said, they hesitated to get into the boat, but yet they followed Jesus. It's not implied what, what, what other reason, but it's implied that they went, they, they did, and it says here that in the darkest hour of the night, the wind was against them, but they were straining and rowing and rowing. They were straining. Uh, Application-wise, if God calls you to do something and you're doing it faithfully and you're just straining and straining and straining and you feel like nothing is going on, Jesus sees that. Amen? Not only that, and this is where the, the whole, and this is where the entire miracle of walking on water came. He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Would have passed them by. Would have passed them by. Ever wondered why? Why would, why would he even actually uh, pass them by? Now you're looking at the miracle so differently. Why? Because God has so much assurance that when he said, take your boat and go, you will get there. You hear that? God has so much assurance in his word, in his command, that if he tells you to do something and you just follow, you will get there. It might take slower. Some of us might do it faster. But it said he would have passed them by. He would have just met them at the finish line. But this is, and this is where we can, we can now uh, know him. That even though he's already said it, and even though he has so much confidence in his word. Go ahead, next verse, please. For, uh, uh, but when they saw him and they were troubled, he immediately talked with them. Talk with them and look at what he said. And said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. When they were troubled, and that's when he what? He brought encouragement through his own word. The entire miracle of walking on water was hinged upon when Jesus said, go. Okay? And he saw them continually, uh, constantly. He was looking at them. And because they were straining, Jesus, uh, Jesus walked on the water. 
I believe he, do, he did it purposely so that they can see him. And, and that's why in the book of John it says, and they willingly accepted him into the boat. Right? They willingly accepted him into the boat. If you're straining, you know, you know God is such, a, uh, is such a gentleman that if you don't ask for help from him, He's always going to make moves and initiate to try to help you. But if you don't ask help from him, he'll probably just pass you by. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Hopefully that's a lesson to be there. But he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. So if you're doing what the Lord tells you to do and you're straining, there's what uh, I think it's Kenneth Hagan who said it. It's called proving time. It's not testing time. Testing and proving, I think, are two different things. We like to use the word testing because out of testing comes uh, testimony. But out of proving comes promotion. Amen. Two different things. Okay? So it says he talked with them. So they were straining for four, it's like three or four miles. It's like you trying to swim from, Hill, uh, from uh, Hilton all the way to, uh, or the other way, uh, from Nico to Hilton. From my experience, the current comes from... Uh, Hilton, and it goes towards uh, Nico. So when you hit Pacific Star or the old Pacific Star, you can feel that rush of uh, water. It just pushes you towards the, uh, towards the right side. Amen? Same thing. They were going against the current. But they were doing the thing that Jesus told them to do. But that's the thing. Jesus never took his eyes off them. He was on the mountaintop. And then what did he do? He came and he broke every supernatural law so that he can come to you in the darkest hour of your night. Hopefully you're willing, okay? And then when they finally saw him and they were troubled and Jesus said he talked with them, he cheered them up, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And the last thing that Jesus did was go ahead and then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel. If you allow him, you can have a shortcut. You know, you can get up on the, say, what's the tallest building in Guam? PIC? How many floors? 100? <laughs> well, let's just say, what is the tallest building in the world? Uh, Burj, Khal uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai. 101 something? Okay. You and me can go and try to beat each other going up. You can take the stairs. And I can take the elevator. <laughs> Who do you think will make it faster? The elevator. There's things of God that I think we prolong it because we're taking the stairs. Okay? If, it's, if, you, if you know and you know that you're doing exactly what the Lord has to, uh, told you and you're feeling the strain of the wind, stay there. Okay? Watch Jesus make a miracle out of that. Watch, let him come to you and walk on water. Move every, everything that's natural and open the supernatural to get to you. Amen? But stay there. Amen. On. One thing that is not mentioned about this is that the disciples never complained, even though they've been rowing for three or four hours. Actually, that, if they left around 6 a.m., that would mean 12 plus 3, uh, uh, 6 plus 3 is they've been... They've been rowing for about nine hours. Okay, my math is good. They've been rowing for about nine hours, but yet it never said anything about them complaining. Amen? Humility is a good thing. Just stay there. Uh, it could be that God is proving you. Amen? So he went up into the boat, and all of a sudden it says the, 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 wind, the wind ceased. In the book of John, it says immediately they were in the place that they were. Amen? Allow him. If you see him, Jesus come. Okay? If you're doing it. Amen? So just a recap. Let's go. A miracle from Jesus. He made his disciples get into the boat and go. God has a calling for you. God has a purpose for you. Okay? Your greatest pleasure, your greatest uh, fulfillment of your desire, your greatest blessings, your greatest everything. Okay? It's in that place where God said, There. Okay, in that place where God has called you, that is where you will find the greatest blessings of your life. Amen? Okay, well, I hope you get convinced eventually. 
Okay? But if you are there, he will continue to keep his eyes on you. He saw them. And he will come to you. He will break. The, and this is where the miracle is. He will, he will remove anything natural and he will get to the supernatural to come to you. He will talk to you, encourage you. And then if you willingly accept him to come into your boat and what you're doing, it says that it, everything will be uh, much better. Amen? Amen? Amen. I hope you're blessed. Let's go ahead and pray. Whew, Father, thank you. Now, do you see this miracle a little differently? Yeah, I know. I, I think when, when we talk about Jesus walking on water, our, our idea is, oh, Lord, I also want to walk on water. Okay? And that's good. But really, the miracle behind it is that the Lord will come to you if you just continue and do what God has told you. He will come to you and break the supernatural just to reach you. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you that we can trust you. According to your word, it says that faith comes through hearing your word. And I pray, Father, right now, allow faith to rise up to come in. Come in, O oh Lord. Come in, O oh Lord. I just want to uh, just pray. Perhaps that's you. You find yourself in that position like the disciples where you, you, you had that experience where you were doing, you were doing, you were doing, then all of a sudden you just gave up. Lord, where are you? And you've been asking, Lord, where are you? I thought you said this is the promise you have for me. But yet you just given up on God. Because you, you couldn't. You couldn't find him anywhere. That's you. But today I hope that this encourages you and you say, Lord, I want to continue with you. I want to get back into the game. I just don't want to be in the sideline anymore. The, the giftings and the calling of God are irrevocable. He does not change his mind. It is up to you whether you continue with it or you stop. The prolonging of your calling or your gifting is totally upon us. Sad to say, but that's the truth. God will not break or alter the words that came out of his lips. So if that's you, but today uh, I'm, making, I'm making this commitment, Lord. I want to get back in the game. I want to continue, Lord. Paul talks about uh, stirring up the gifts. The gifts will remain the same. The gifts and the calling is there. But you got to commit and you got to come. Amen? If that's you, I want to pray for you. All right? I want to, I want, I want to pray along with you. So if that's you, just go ahead. You raise up your hand and I'll pray together. Okay, I see that hand. You're a believer. You know, you, you know big time that you've stopped following. Okay? Anybody else? Okay, see those hands? All right. Okay, let's go pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are true. Thank you that you do not change, that I can trust that about you. But Lord, I have not. I have changed. But today, I'm making this commitment once more. I'm coming back to you. And I want to say, I want to make it to the finish line. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. And from this day, I thank you that you're, as, you're always watching me. And you see the things that I'm going through. And I will continue to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before we dismiss, one more prayer, I'm sorry. Just in case, I know I, 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 in the beginning I talked about if you're born again, if you're a believer, then there's a difference between that and you not being a believer, okay? If you're here today and uh, somehow, not to offend you, but that's the category you're in, you've never made a decision to follow the Lord. You've been coming to church, yes? You know, I've been listening to Pastor Mar, I've been listening to all the pastors, but you've never made that decision and said, Lord, I want to follow you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. If, uh, one more time, if that's you and you've never made that decision yet, I don't want you to leave without making that today. So if everybody can just close their eyes one more time, I'm sorry. If that's you, I just want to make sure before we dismiss, is there anybody here today that's that, but today you, you want to make that commitment and say, Lord, today I want to follow you. I want to make you the Lord of your life. You've never done it before. Anybody? By chance, you can just raise up your hand. I'll pray with you. Nope, we're good. Okay, we're good.
Father, thank you for today. Father, bless us, keep us, protect us, keep us in the eyes of your, keep uh, as your word tells us, your, oh, your eyes are always upon us. So, Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that, Lord, we would go out here and we will continue to do what you've called us to do. We would find our dare and we will continue to walk in that till we get to the finish line. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed, church.